I've just been lost about 30 odd seconds more. We're just about to start. Great, so Bhatma has also joined us again. Uh, so let's start. So good evening to all of you. My name is Ajay Nair, and on behalf of ASK, we wish you a, a very happy, healthy, and prosperous new year. I welcome you today to this quarterly webinar with Mr. Barisha, who is the executive director for ASK Group. As we've done in the past, uh, we've scheduled about an hour for this webinar, but I'll request Bharat by to share his views on uh, equity markets for approximately 50 hour minutes. We'll follow that up with uh, question and answers. I also request all participants to type in their uh, questions in the chat box, and we will try to get them all answered. With that, Bharat Bhai, if I request uh, you uh, to share views on equity markets and the flow is all yours. It just sounds very formal, suited, booted. The way he's introducing and talking also is at the height of formality. So basically, views about the markets is uh, what you want me to uh, do a bit of a curtain raise, right? And uh, then the question answers. So shall we go straight into question answers? We can, we can start with the curtain raise as well, for sure. Okay. No, so uh, 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 this is a sequel to uh, the earlier calls. My view uh, remains the same. Uh, it is unchanged that we as a country are at the cusp of one of the greatest economic expansions that we have not seen before as a country. I think several businesses are at a threshold of significant breakthrough in their journey, in their evolution. And all of that will reflect not only in their size but of the top line, but also of the profits and cash flows and eventually into their market value. In turn, all of these will reflect into the wealth of the owners of those businesses or the shareholders of those businesses because a lot of businesses qualitatively which are sound are at a cusp of an unprecedented opportunity of a kind that doesn't come often. And finally, this will eventually reflect into the value creation by investors either for in their own portfolios or that for the others that they manage. Never, and I'm saying with a full sense of responsibility, uh, and I'm usually not given to talking about markets or opining on indices or uh, predicting uh, where the markets would be, etc. And I'm not seeking to do it even today, but uh, on a more longer term, uh, kind of a uh, picture. I think this is one of the most unprecedented defining moments in the history and the future of this country. And therefore, the kind of economy that we will see in uh, some time to come uh, will be irrecognizable in terms of the shape size, character, we will see it similarly into the businesses. Many of the businesses will be irrecognizable uh, at some stage into the sheer size and character that they've acquired and therefore the value. 
And I would dare say even investors, uh, the kind of wealth which will be created over uh, the coming period will be unprecedented. And I, when I'm talking about the coming period, I'm not talking of a short period of three and five years or seven years. I'm talking of medium to long period of uh, 10 to 15 to 20 year kind of uh, opportunity. Surely that will not be free from volatility. Occasionally there'll be violence as well in the markets because that is the nature of the market. That is the character of the beast. Markets are never free from volatility and occasionally they suffer blood and gore and violence as well. But through that volatility and through some of the violence which will come on the way uh, lies an unprecedented upward sloping uh, outsized value creation opportunity of a kind in which has not been witnessed. And many factors are combining together. The key part is uh, reforms when they are limited. They come in a haphazard way without a kind of a logic connecting them together. And uh, when the reforms are sporadic and shallow, the maximum benefit that you can hope to get will be arithmetic sum total of the benefit of each of the reform. And that's a max you can hope to get. But reforms, when they are deep, they are sustained, they come in a regular frequency and they're logically combining together. They are not some sporadic, isolated uh, glory. Uh, then the reforms create an e ecosystem. And then the outcome is no longer the arithmetic sum total, but a geometric force multiplier. And that roughly is a point my sense is that we are standing as a country, as society, <coughs> as economy, as businesses, uh, somebody saying that my audio is feeble. Uh, uh, that is more about my voice rather than about audio. But I think I'm speaking at a greater volume than I usually speak. So is there anything to be done technically to improve the audio quality? But although your voice is clear to me, I can hear you very well. Okay. All right. So uh, if there is a problem, uh, uh, please let me know. Sure. Uh, so the, um, uh, you see when reforms combine together, they create a very powerful ecosystem. And we have come this path in this long based on many important reforms uh, that have occurred in these nine and 10 year period, which are now today combining together to create a galvanizing force. So please be, uh, 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 please be, uh, um, you know, appreciative of the fact that we are not in a usual time frame. We are not in a usual, uh, EU, in a usual uh, phase of an existence or a evolution of an economy or a country. We are at a cusp of a defining moment. And in the defining phase, uh, uh, the kind of outcomes that are going to come, not only the rate and the size of the outcome will be defining, but its durability, because that is what gives a compounding power. It is one thing to have a good growth, but for a limited period of time. It is another thing to have a long period of growth, but a very limited growth. It is most unusual to get a decent growth, but for a very long period of time. And I think we are in that phase today. <laughs> Therefore, any shorter term attempts to keep evaluating topical matters, any short term change, any short term events and episodes and incidents which will keep coming about and human existence in the world is full of complexity. So a lot of things will keep happening all the time. 
sometimes war, sometimes attempts at peace, sometimes economic challenges, sometimes fed, uh, sometimes something else. But through all of that, constant uh, singing and noise which will go on in the background, uh, I want uh, all of you to be left with one impression that I strongly believe in, that we are into a defining period. And uh, rate of growth will distinct, character of the growth will distinguish itself, durability of that growth will distinguish itself, and predictability again will distinguish itself. And all these will come package with a rising crescendo where many reforms are combining to provide a geometric kind of combination and not arithmetic. Therefore, this is not period as usual. Also, one last point I'll make is very, very few economies have a size and a depth and a character <clears throat> to create a market which is of a meaningful size. No matter how good Taiwan is, or no matter how good in some pockets uh, Indonesia or Vietnam may be, no matter how good uh, Bangladesh may be in some ready-made garments and all of that, but, or no matter how good South Korea may be into some chip making and electronics. But very, very few economies really have a character and depth and size to create a market which is of a size and substance. At one point of time, I would have said probably no more than five names, which is America, uh, China, uh, Germany, Japan, in India. Today, <clears throat> I would drop Germany and Japan also out of that. Really, the game is America, India, and China. The second point I'll make there is not only very few economies have character and size to create a market of that kind, very few markets have a character to create value and to keep continue to create value for a long period of time in adequate variety. On that score, even China drops out, out of the short list of the three that I made. And therefore, <coughs> <coughs> the short list probably comes down to two. It is India and America. And within that, I think India going ahead I do not have any doubt will distinguish itself by the rate of growth well, well ahead that America will produce. And therefore, uh, one last point I'm making is that this is a special, special period uh, of the defining variety. So I'll stop here. I don't have any short term 2024 view. Mm, one year is too short for me to be able to make any prediction. I neither have any ability to make those kind of predictions, nor I think it is really necessary when opportunity is so gigantic. Trying to uh, trying to lose energy and getting distracted by short term events uh, may not really be uh, 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 may not really be uh, material. So I'll stop here and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Darbhai. Uh, so we actually, we've got lots of questions right now. Uh, some of them were uh, the ones that you mentioned right now, more about 2024 elections and interest rates. But as you rightly mentioned, uh, I think you want to look at more of the long-term story. No, but I'll uh, so answer me... any of those questions. Questions so me... can be any. I'm happy to answer. Then uh... that sounds good. So let me then ask the first question to you. Uh, you know, actually, you were amongst the first proponents to sp speak about the golden decade that lies in front of us. And now we're talking about maybe, you know, multiple decades of growth. But uh, this, again, pertains specifically to 2024, where you're talking about elections to come in here and globally in a few nations. We're talking about, uh, you know, interest rates and how they will behave, uh, hopefully, in our downward trajectory with inflation softening. Uh, people still want to understand how that impacts, uh, you know, 
uh, India specifically. So coming to that, um, the problem of the developed world, America and Europe and others, doesn't automatically have to become a problem of India. Second, but in the past, that was kind of true, whether merited or otherwise, but the problems of the Western world, their inefficiency, their artificial fiction created by them, for example, uh, the move towards uh, close to 0% interest rate that the Western world conjured up, uh, was an artificial concoction and uh, was not tenable but it prevailed and it cast a shadow on others. Many times, Western world has set the narrative for the world, whether right or otherwise, whether in their own interest or uh, to the disadvantage of others. But since many parts of the world were not in a position to counter that, uh, to that extent, that worldview uh, kind of became the view of the Western world. Uh, even if it was uh, inaccurate, feeble, or actually false. I think one of the important things that has happened in uh, the country, and that's where I talked about earlier, character of the growth, durability of the growth. This comes when you have self-confidence and belief about what you do, that your destiny is within your control and is not hijacked by the actions of the others. I mean, uh, you know, nobody is a Robinson Crusoe. We live in a world which is connected. And to that extent, there is an impact of what the rest of the world does on what you do. But it is one thing to be watching and observing the world, what it is doing and trying to do for yourself what is good. It is another where your destiny is not in your hand and it is entirely influenced by the others. For a length of time, the Western world has worked with that kind of a narrative and has gotten away. I think increasingly, uh, a country like India is showing the way. And uh, today, more than any other country, which is unthinkable, but global times of China, yesterday, accorded approval to that, that India is pursuing a very strong economic path, a path which is of self-confidence. These words are unusual to be heard from the mouthpiece of uh, Chinese uh, authority. And uh, Global Times is the mouthpiece of uh, China. So uh, that saying this is a remarkable uh, fresh, or fresh uh, air, really. And it said that India is setting an impact on the narrative of the world and the way the world is moving. Many of these aspects are not merely uh, theoretical and, uh, you know, a kind of uh, philosophical discussions on a glass of drink. Uh, your ability to operate effectively as a global citizen as a country and your ability to influence what is right for you. Like we bought uh, Russian crude because it was in our interest. Uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Puri very categorically said, we are buying more now from some of the others because we are getting that oil even at a better price than what Russia is able to offer. These intelligent at the same time, responsible pursuit of your own self-interest is a very vital thing for a country to acquire, to keep its own destiny under control. I think um, the leadership, one of the biggest contributions that is made to the benefit of this country, I would say, is to bring that confidence, that self-belief, to stand by our own uh, interests, uh, which are right interests, and to stand by what we think is correct, rather than be swung by what others want us to do. And I think interest rate narrative also will follow that path. Our sources for attracting supply of capital are different today. 
our sources, uh, our need, the sources of demand for the capital are also variegated. So both on source of the capital or the supply of capital, as well as demand for capital, on both of the sides, there are multifarious entities and uh, sources. And in each of them, uh, we are getting more sophisticated and more evolved. And uh, we have been steadfast in fiscal deficit control. We do not want to just grow while throwing caution to the wind by fiscal deficit being unmindful or current account deficit being unmindful. And therefore, structurally, inflation is under control. And therefore, interest rates logically in India will have a reason to be under control. That doesn't mean that uh, when America has to reduce uh, the interest rate or they have to tighten, uh, it can't have in, no impact on India. But the point I'm trying to make is the impact earlier would have been kind of a paid impact where we had a no choice. And that imp then we were like a slavish uh, outpost to the Western world. Uh, that is not the case any longer. We have our own thinking. We have our own mind. We have our own interest to guard. We have our own regulatory evolution and sophistication of that mechanism to find out what is the correct path for us, uh, uh, whether as a central banker, whether as intelligent pursuit of our foreign interests, whether as a global citizen in, in a political uh, world uh, where we stand uh, as an entity. In each of these, we have carved out our path. And therefore, that path, to my mind, is not particularly dependent on the short-term machinations and short-term ups and downs of the policy flux of the Western world. Final point I'll make is Western world, one of the defining things earlier was leadership quality in the policy arena. Generally, Western world displayed greater policy leadership more astute policy formulation, more uh, astute policy responses to the challenges. But I would say over last uh, some time, uh, uh, some decades, I would say, very clearly Western world has gradually ceded and surrendered policy leadership place uh, in the world. And uh, to the good of India, some amount of that latitude on the policy vacuum, actually, India is beginning to assert leadership and uh, attempting to fill out. Sure, there'll be a uh, world which is accustomed to the past behavioral norm of the Western world and how India will tamely accept, will keep uh, creating conflict and narrative. But uh, I, I think India is firmly and clearly on a right path. And therefore, our interest rates, our policy formulation, our inflationary trajectory increasingly will be more because of our policy formulation and ability to stand for it rather than uh, totally swung by the rest of the world. Thanks, Bharat Dai. Uh, just linking another question to this, you know, uh, everything actually seems positive. Uh, you know, everyday news that we hear of is mostly positive right now. And we spoke about very strong growth coming in as well. But I would like to understand from you, what can be a hiccup or what can be something which can stall this growth or stall the narrative that we've been building right now? Well, it is tempting to put, uh, you know, uh, it can be geopolitical events, it could be wars, it could be conflicts. World is always full of noise and lack of peace. Uh, we are constantly seeing something or the other keeps going on somewhere or the other. We can also talk about oil prices. We can talk about uh, uh, some of the other uh, afflictions and the challenges which keep coming about. I'm not making light of any of these. All of these are important issues. They do have an impact. It is in the near term, in the shorter term, any of the issues uh, can create difficulty. Supply chains is another issue in a conflicted world, world which is 
at a relatively less reconciled situation with each other, supply chains have become global and therefore supply chains become vulnerable. And therefore disruptions, difficulties uh, can be thrown around. All of these are material points, important challenges. Uh, we also have uh, within our neighborhood uh, issues to deal with on a geopolitical front. And therefore, there can be difficulties and challenges on that account too. But none of these points that I mentioned, really speaking, I would regard it as a threat. I would regard them as difficulties. Some of them are challenges. Some of them can be troublesome for some length of time. But none of them, I would call it as a threat. Uh, none of them I would regard it as, uh, 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 none of that I would regard it as uh, something unbeatable or uh, which cannot be dealt with by a determined country, determined leadership, leadership which is purposive. Uh, any of these uh, end challenges can be overcome. I mean, COVID is an ideal example. Uncharted territory, global scale challenge, uh, very different kind of a monster to deal with and uh, with limited economic and health resources of India that could have become an unthinkably large, uh, uh, unbelievable challenge to deal with. But we have dealt with it and better than probably virtually any other country in the world. And here we are when the rest of the world is still struggling with the inflation and the growth rate. Yeah, we are uh, uh, pretty much there even in a difficult year like the current one where we'll end up with uh, more than 6.757% kind of real GDP growth rate and a nominal GDP growth rate of 11-12% plus. Uh, this is remarkable and noteworthy. Therefore, I would only say one thing. Many of the reforms many of the positives that we have built into the system today, much of the confidence that internally society and the businesses and economy are displaying, the kind of confidence that the world is beginning to repose in us, all of that is not a chance. It's not a happenstance. It is not a random thing which has happened. And it is not a tactical flow of the season. It has happened because we have embarked upon many reforms as a country. We have been firm on that, uh, whether we talk about technology embrace, whether we talk about digital public goods, whether the infrastructure, whether the roads, whether the logistics, whether the uh, uh, startup ecosystem, whether the uh, GST and transparent uh, uh, statues, uh, uh, transparency in direct access, faceless assessments, RERA, insolvency, bankruptcy, many things and a reduction in the cost of capital. Many, many things have happened and many more are waiting to happen it is because somebody somewhere is working to ensure that these ecosystem and crescendo is built. Therefore, I would say we have come this far is because of a special uh, set of purposive and energized leadership that we are witnessing. And my view is not political. I have zero interest in politics. Uh, my only interest is in the economy, its prosperity, prosperity and growth of the uh, India's citizens and uh, opportunity for the businesses and investors to create value. My interest is only confined to that. Politics is of zero interest to me in anything. And therefore, my view is nothing to do with any political view. All that I'm merely saying is leadership is very critical. Leadership, whether in a family, in a family of four or five members, also leadership is critical. Leadership in firm or a business, leadership in a society, leadership in a country. Everywhere leadership makes a difference. And therefore, 
many good things have happened. Good things are about to happen and many more are waiting in the wings. We need current set of intensity and purposive policy framework leadership to continue at least for some more time uh, for us to fully galvanize this advantage in our favor. So that I think is the most important uh, 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 you know, uh, issue I like to put on the table. Uh, one last point I'll say, a lot of time I keep hearing that irrespective of anything, irrespective of whoever, India will grow at X percentage or Y percentage or Z. Uh, I disagree. Uh, God has not uh, given benediction to India of a special variety that irrespective of anything, India will grow at X rate or Y per rate or Z rate. Now, you have to do things, you have to form policies, you have to take actions, you have to take, respond to challenges, you have to facilitate the path, you have to inspire the world to follow you in that uh, path. Many things have to happen for a growth to happen. Uh, growth in a business is never accidental, growth in a country is never accidental. Leadership has a lot of role to play in that. And therefore, difference between 7% growth rate and 4% or 4.5% is a huge gap over a period of time. And uh, uh, it is not automatic that irrespective of anything we can go. Therefore, only important point I'll put on the table, while there, are, there can be many mid-level or material level of issues or challenges, but none of them I would regard as state. I will say policy formulation, continuity, intensity of it, its relevance, and purposive effort of the leadership to steer the country in the intended direction to the prosperity that is due to us. Great, Bharat Bhai. Uh, multiple investors actually asking questions and the specific to performance are right, right now. Um, and most of these queries I can see are from 21, 22, uh, invested levels. Um, you know, so if we can, I'm just clubbing multiple questions together to understand what we've done maybe in the last year, which can actually aid the portfolio, uh, to cover the, maybe the performance gap that got built in 2022. And we've also seen multiple, you know, newer entries happening across ASK portfolios in 2023, like IEP has six new entries <clears throat> happening in the financial year. Uh, so do we believe that, and if I can state this point, that one, newer ideas can also help build the pullback, and second, maybe the valuation discount of the older names will aid the portfolio growth. Would just have like to understand your views in terms of the underperformance and how uh, we can see that getting uh, built. Yeah, yeah. also uh, uh, make a direct point. Uh, there's no need to go about it in a roundabout way. In the year of 2022, we did not perform well. The fact of the matter is, yes, uh, we have not performed as well as we would have liked to, in, in that we have been accustomed to over two decades, uh, where uh, usually the way we have performed period after period is being of a far uh, stronger variety. So year of 2022 has been uh, a, a difficult year. We have not performed as per what we should have or what we have done historically or what would have been our expectation. So there is no doubt about it. I saw some of the questions also while talking to you or while I was talking uh, uh, some people have talked about a uh, challenge in the Indian entrepreneurial portfolio that they made investment about two years back, two and a half years back, but they've not seen as much return as they would have liked to see. Uh, there is no doubt about it. I first and foremost very clearly agree with that. Whether it is to our liking, certainly not. Whether it could have been better, certainly yes. Whether we could have done something more, uh, yes, we could have done something more. Whether there were issues which were beyond our control, probably that also I would say is true in some case. In Indian entrepreneurial portfolio, particularly, uh, 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 and uh, just now somebody is saying that there has been difference compared to index which has been material, uh, yes, 
in 2022, indeed, the difference between us and the index has been unusually large, and which has not happened. Usually, we have a positive difference of that kind in our favor. On In many, many years, we've seen a strong double-digit uh, favorable difference in our favor in the portfolio over uh, 21 and 22 years of growth portfolio or 15 years of uh, Indian entrepreneurial portfolio. So that also is true. Uh, I, I will not make light of any of these. Only one issue um, uh, I will just add, while we could have done something more in the existing portfolios, induce some uh, good names a uh, little early, some names we could have gotten into itself, uh, which we might have missed out, uh, or some of the names uh, probably had to witness an unfortunate exit, like Dixon, which was actually very heartbreaking, I would say, where at the fake end of the uh, damage, uh, the stock had to be exited, and now it is at a lifetime new high. In a matter of just about a year, it is up some 150-odd percent. Which was part of the portfolios. So some of these certainly are true. Uh, delayed action uh, or uh, a, a, some names which could have come in but were not there. Some names unfortunately witness an exit uh, for a variety of reasons and shouldn't have. But one thing, if at all, I would like to put it in. Uh, context is uh, 2022 happened to be a year which was distinguished for public sector units. This is the first year after an eight year gap when uh, public sector units did not just well but outstandingly well. If you look at a record of the public sector, entire uh, public sector unit basket. In the previous eight-year period, that is 2013 to 21, the entire basket, if you had put 100 rupees at the beginning of the eight-year basket, after eight years, it ended with 78 rupees. So 22% erosion after eight years in the basket in entirety of all public sector units. But 2022, blockbuster year, where virtually many names double, triple, even quadrupled in the public sector arena. And scores of names went up by 50%, 75%. And in that year, Nifty went up by 4%. So we can, we can kind of correlate as to how strong public sector performance was. In 2023, uh, the strong performance of PSUs has continued. It is not as if it has gone away. It is not as high as 2022, but it is still very, very robust. Uh, well in excess of what Nifty has done for 2023, which is Nifty has done, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 17, 18%. And public sector units have done much better than that, even in 2023. The issue is whether it is a flashing pen and whether it is a temporary hudra. Uh, uh, and second question is what we could have done about it. As far as the first question is concerned, uh, I would like to say I do not believe it is uh, It's a flashing pen performance by PSUs. It's not some short-term hurrah which has happened and which may badly fizzle out. Uh, none of what I'm seeing uh, really indicates that. What exactly has changed for the public sector? I think the contract of the public sector businesses with the government, which is uh, the largest shareholder typically of the PSU units, uh, central public sector units, um, I think that contract has undergone a massive change. The PSU businesses have found and have gotten great autonomy. Today, most of them are able to operate in their own space virtually independently. At the same time, there has been a greater supervision and greater accountability, uh, which is what the shareholder is demanding, which is government of India. 
On the other end, uh, uh, they get operating freedom and autonomy to do what is in their uh, interest and for value creation. At the same time, <clears throat> producing accountability. Along with that, government itself has been largest supplier of the business for PSU units. So defense uh, PSUs are getting large orders from the government of India. Uh, similarly, energy, similarly, capital goods, similarly, infrastructure. And many of these areas typically are at the forefront where public sector units are at a forefront more than the private. And therefore, <coughs> government has given them large order books suddenly, which they had no chance of seeing for a length of time. This gives a visibility, predictability for long term and size. Government has given them autonomy and level playing field. At the same time, government has improved supervision and accountability. And overall, hygiene and governance practices have improved dramatically. And this is the revised contract between the largest shareholder of PSU units, which is Government of India, and the mm, uh, PSU units are concerned. And therefore, Many of the fundamental issues with the PSU businesses, uh, where uh, lack of uh, a right kind of leadership in those businesses, longevity of the business, lack of adequate autonomy, and uh, many of the PSUs were prone to less than uh, uh, the most ideal kind of a governance one would have thought. All of these have dramatically altered. Along with that, we, we can see how public sector banks have altered where they were mired with a huge amount of bad debts and terrible asset quality. And today, public sector banks are in a squeaky clean position as far as the balance sheet and situation is concerned. It is now for them to produce uh, their value creation. Therefore, this particular change Mm, uh, along with government itself being a largest supplier of the business opportunity under Atmanirbhar campaign, uh, all of that has dramatically altered the fortunes of the PSU businesses. And therefore, I think while eight year 2013 to 21 may have been um, huge amount of uh, damage on PSU space, but 22 blockbuster, 23 huge uh, outperformer and none of that into my mind is uh, flesh and pan. It is something which is going to be there for a length of time and I think fundamentally the rules of the game for uh, as far as the markets are concerned in treating PSU units are, is concerned is altered. This is what I believe. Indian entrepreneurial portfolio, in particular, by definition, as you know, can only buy entrepreneurial firms, cannot buy into uh, PSU businesses, cannot buy into MNCs, cannot buy into purely professional firms. And to that extent, 2022 index and 2023 index has benefited Nifty or any other indices due to huge outperformance by PSU businesses. But the entrepreneurial businesses within uh, the two baskets, uh, within the indices, have actually not done all that well. In 2022, actually, entrepreneurial basket posted negative returns uh, in entirety. 2023, still behind the index, uh, though a positive performance. <laughs> Therefore, index has benefited from uh, PSU upsurge and resurgence. Uh, IP portfolio uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, participate there. So that is one challenge. But that is a challenge which we have selected. And um, it has stood us well over in uh, 15 years uh, that IP has been around. It has stood well for IP. Uh, in uh, 13 of those years. In these two years, uh, I think uh, it, it is, it, 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 there has been a challenge. But I, my feeling is PSUs per se will now perform based on their merits and their strength. 
but a staggering kind of uh, returns uh, that 22 and 23 generated. Now it will be business as usual mostly where each uh, in individual business, entrepreneurial or PSU or whatever, based on their own strain, behavior, performance, will create outcome in Britain. So hopefully the game now becomes uh, relatively more evened out. But uh, PSU structurally uh, need to be part of the portfolios is a reality. In IP, we cannot buy. So uh, that is a constraint, but a self-imposed constraint. And I'm not offering any apology. Uh, underlying businesses in IP continue to be robust and strong. And independent of all of these, they will continue to deliver on an absolute basis, satisfying healthy double-digit outcomes in, over time uh, per annum compounded, as well as relative superiority to the benchmarks, even though it can't participate into some of the names uh, in PSU and others. But... Uh, we are not apologetic. We are not uh, unduly concerned. It's a good challenge to fight with. It's a good uh, battle to fight with. In other portfolios where we have flexibility to buy into, we are appropriately weaving into some of these names uh, to build that uh, appropriate opportunity set. But in IP, even with this limitation, it still will do what it is supposed to do and what it is supposed to produce. So last two years, I must submit to you has been a bit of a challenge for the reasons that I mentioned. Also, in addition to that, I must admit that some names, whether we could have gotten early, yes, we could have in IP. Whether we some names we should have exited and or we should have retained, for example, Dixon, we should have retained and not exited. Some names, uh, whether we missed out completely, yes, certainly we have missed out. So some of these we could have uh, we could have dealt with and we should have rectified, but every such uh, phase is a learning, and uh, it's a huge learning, and I embrace it with positivity rather than any sense of concern. So that is a good fight to have, and we believe we'll continue to deliver like IP has over fifteen years growth portfolio over twenty two years healthy absolute um, double digit compounding over long run. And healthy alpha vis-a-vis -vis indices on a per annum compounded basis, both would occur mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And I have uh, no real doubt about uh, that. Thanks, Bhav. Uh, just maybe adding something more to uh, what you mentioned as a question is that uh, as per you, what sectors that we've added weights in uh, maybe in the last year, 18 months, uh, or which segments do you think will really drive growth? for our portfolios going forward for the coming uh, couple of years? Uh, I would uh, uh, I would only say this much. Uh, our focus is to be on individual businesses on a bottom-up basis. We are buying stocks. We don't buy sectors. We don't buy markets. We don't buy indices. We don't buy theme or a train. We buy businesses. Micro basis, whether the management of the business is sound, whether the character of the business is such that it will create value, whether uh, we, whether the management is what it takes to create value of a sustainable nature, whether the size of opportunity is large, so that the business can have meaningful growth potential, whether the actual growth rate will be sound enough to create powerful compounding force, whether the quality of growth, capital efficiency, return on capital employed, return on equity, modes, financial strength, ability of the business to withstand external challenges, all of these have a deep bearing on the value of a business. And we have to buy such businesses which are valuable at some margin of safety. So that we can get future growth is one return of a per annum variety. We get a second return due to superior quality of growth. Again, is a per annum cherry on the top of that growth rate, which is a cake. And third, we get a margin of safety is a one-time extra, where the value of a business, in our opinion, is lower than the price today. So all of these we have to play and try to get it on our side. 
But that said, uh, therefore, investing remains basically bottom up. But that said, I would say in a growing economy, a large growth economy of India type, many, many things will perform. And when an economy reaches a sweet spot of crescendo, many new segments will come by. Who thought about, uh, uh, you know, uh, EMS space, electronic uh, manufacturing uh, uh, service as a business? But today it is a reality. Mm, who thought that India can ever make uh, semiconductors? But today it is not now uh, a pipe dream. We know that in some time to come, we'll be there. Who thought about creating um, value chain for manufacturing mobile phones where we were chronic importers and now we have become exporters of the mobile phones in the world? And many of the opportunities will spring up. Uh, and these opportunities will spring up not only because the world is not trusting China or China is no longer uh, is reliable from the point of view of the world. E e that in itself is an opportunity, but even otherwise, I think India has put itself in many sweet areas to make uh, uh, herself more attractive. And therefore, many new opportunities will spring up. In manufacturing, we are seeing that Europe, for example, in many areas, Europe manufacturing is no longer viable. Their energy costs, their people costs, their manufacturing infrastructure costs, their logistics costs. <laughs> Many of the areas makes uh, Europe uh, manufacturing incompetitive. Irrespective of anybody else, they can't and therefore they need reliable supply chain which will uh, replace these. These plants either will close down or they have to be sold out. And therefore, India, I think, strategically is in a very important uh, position. Therefore, many, many things will do well. It is not just speciality chemical or it is not just consumption. But within consumption, rather than staples or regular uh, FMCG, it will be more discretionary. It will be more, say, consumer de de uh, durable. It will be more, uh, you know, luxury, uh, either of uh, consumption of goods or luxury consumption of services. Uh, these areas uh, will find attraction. In every area, I think uh, aspirational India uh, is looking for a better quality, better product, better value for money, and better uh, uh, thing to be had. So consumption will do well. I think infrastructure growth will produce tremendous opportunity in various areas of infrastructure. Capital goods supply and chain will do wonderfully well in that area. Uh, uh, lending has to do well. Lending sector actually is in a pink of health. Uh, cost of capital has come down. Bed debt and bed asset uh, problem has been resolved. Mm, uh, the uh, the generally demand for capital is uh, shot up uh, nicely from various sources. Supply of capital has opened up, and therefore, uh, uh, and valuations are very very reasonable. A uh, lot of lenders will do wonderfully well over a period of time. Insurance is another area. Specialty chemical, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical related like medical devices, the hospital or healthcare related opportunity, even infra building, uh, ordinary sounding businesses like cement and uh, building material uh, businesses, many will do well. So I, I don't think... Uh, really speaking, we have to get worried about uh, finding a sector or trying to ride a theme. Manufacturing in various areas, I mean, manufacturing is a la large net. And therefore, many, many areas, uh, given the opened up hunger and um, uh, panache to get really uh, manufacturing, kickstarting in earnestness, and which is... Uh, within the potential and capability of India, which was denied all this time, manufacturing will do phenomenally well over a period of time. So plenty of areas, I would say. Yes, uh, just a few questions again coming on, maybe a little bit stock specific as well. 
a few names like a page avenue supermarket which have actually maybe been a bit of a drag on the performance uh your views in terms of the reason why we've been holding on to them and how we see them going forward well both of these uh, uh, uh you're absolutely right uh, page has been a bit of a drag uh in last uh, three quarters or so uh, demand super avenue supermarket has been a drag for uh, almost uh, two years now uh he is not really delivered both businesses continue to be very sound well run uh, very strong on capital efficiency and growth metrics uh, till now but uh, they have fallen short of the um, expectations of what is possible to get in these businesses today and therefore markets have been uh, have responded negatively and rightly so <clears throat> both of these names uh, we have uh, either reduced or uh, eliminated exposure in different portfolios in a different way but in some of the portfolios we still have some level of exposure uh, in the businesses businesses mind you per se are outstanding uh, in capital efficiency in governance in terms of fundamental strength leadership position in their respective activity but each of these businesses have some challenge which they need to find an answer to <coughs> more so for avenue supermarket i would say avenue supermarket continues to do on grocery business well but on non grocery business which is a higher margin activity in which improves overall profitability in the growth of the business of avenue on that uh, post covid they have been found to be wanting uh, they have fallen behind in getting that growth rate uh, some of the competition of avenue supermarket have been able to do it much better and therefore i'm sure avenue supermarket also is aware and uh, they need to catch up but so far uh, they have not been able to really fully get around to that uh, uh, sorting out the issue on non grocery performance page i do not think is an issue of page having failed to make any strategic or competitive choices which have been weak or failures page has been competitively doing the right things they have deepened the distribution they have expanded the distribution chain around the country even in uh, tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 level also they are beginning to penetrate they successfully finish uh, con- company wide dealer distribution network wide automation and technology projects whereby inventory management billing and uh, um, uh, sales purchase activity can happen efficiently and in time so that took some toll on the company because such major technology projects uh, do result in disturbance for some length of time before systems are fully sorted out and not just within the company but also dealer distribution network so that project is now completed and it is behind but it took almost about uh, uh, <clears throat> uh two years for with the project was under implementation and it did affect some amount of this uh, with a disruption in the activity uh, <clears throat> uh in terms of the product portfolio uh, again page has done well they continue to deepen their uh, main portfolio where they are very strong leader in the women portfolio they have continued to expand the product basket and make themselves more attractive and they have gotten into new verticals kids area where there is a strong focus um, other uh, eth leaser the product basket their promotion all of that is uh, considerably been in a right track i would say also they what they have done well is on the cost containment and internal restructuring to see uh, a very efficient company otherwise but in every organization there is something uh, you can uh, make more improvement upon when you focus and therefore they have done that too so overall competitive versus pages done uh, quite well on product portfolio on design on distribution network in technology in transformational project and cost containment and brand and promotion building but strangely there has been 
some lull in the innerware industry itself, which is hard to explain why <clears throat> innerware industry is going through a kind of a bit of a slowdown. <coughs> <coughs> It is this slowdown that page is witnessing in industry rather than any problem in the end of the page, which has been affecting the performance over the last three quarters, which has been muted. Mm -hmm. And therefore, markets have also uh, responded uh, negatively accordingly. But um, in Avenue Supermart, uh, of course, they need to make uh, some of the more strategic competitive choices which will improve the strength of the business on non-grocery side. But on page, I can reasonably say they have been doing right things. We internally uh, have paid down exposure uh, to these names. And in some of the portfolios, we have completely moved out of these uh, names. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, uh, these names have been a uh, bit of a break for some time. Uh, we are watching and we'll take appropriate action if need be uh, on on what we have. Right. And the next question mostly was around the earnings. Uh, so a lot of people wish to understand and probably ask my own question as well along with that. So in Q2, we had a strong jump in profits. All the revenue remained muted. Uh, we are again about to enter the result cycle uh, for Q3. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, maybe just to take a cue, Bajaj Finance came up with some data points yesterday where they saw AUM go to 35% to 3.1 lakh crores, probably showcasing or hinting that maybe we would, should have a good festive season. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of how probably H2 for this year will play out and maybe F525 numbers also should play out for our portfolios? Well, I'm, I, I remain very constructive and positive. Uh... Uh, I believe uh, in general, good businesses in general will continue to do well and very healthy double digit kind of earnings growth. Uh, and for our portfolio in particular, I continue to remain uh, very positive that strong double digit kind of uh, 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 profitability growth uh, continues to remain in picture. Also, all of that is coming along with improving capital efficiency, uh, both return on capital employed, return on equity. It is also coming along with the rising, um, uh, on a large base, uh, higher growth. Therefore, it shows the strength of the economy as well as the strength of the businesses. And um, to illustrate one point, for the first time uh, last year, return on equity of corporate listed India exceeded uh, that of America and has become number one in the world. And return on equity is a very important long-term barometer for value creation. And one of the key secret sources why American markets over long run have been the number one return producing market in the world. Mm, quietly, but importantly, last year for the first time, India has emerged to take that trophy is number one uh, corporate India, listed corporate India, uh, is number one con uh, market in the world with the highest return on equity. Even mm, financial structure, debt equity ratio, prudence of the debt equity has also improved in the businesses. So mm, businesses' uh, internal financial structure is sounder, Cost of capital is uh, relatively more affordable. Uh, government sustained effort on capital expenditure, which by and large, government has carried the burden on its shoulders. But now we are at a cusp of a point where government capital expenditure will crowd in the private expenditure. Capacity utilization in the economy is now touching 80%, mm -hmm. roughly around 70 to 75% level of capacity utilization, uh, capital expenditure cycle kicks in. We have already crossed that number. So I think the CAPEX cycle is around the corner. Balance sheets of the corporates are healthy on debt equity side as well as profitability side. Uh, there is a demand because of the growth of the economy. And therefore, um, capital expenditure will happen in order to meet with the demand. So I think we have a nice symbiotic kind of an ecosystem 
where manufacturing industry uh, services and uh, uh, infra and uh, other businesses all will combine together to create to keep creating rising crescendo and uh, so i remain very sanguine uh, uh, h2 is too short a period to make any uh, any profound judgment about uh, but h2 still having said that will be healthy for corporate india the listed india and for our portfolio companies i uh, remain very very confident that uh, very healthy uh, strong profit growth and uh, compounding is on the end well along with superior roc superior roe superior balance sheet and a larger and improving size of opportunity so on a longer term basis uh, one of the important reasons why indian market valuation will improve is because of the higher rate growth rate of growth on a larger basis structurally than in the past therefore structurally higher uh, and longer period uh, sustained growth rate is one of the key reasons why valuation has to improve and that's purely mathematical <clears throat> Thanks, just coming to a more uh, generic question and again a lot of participants have asked this uh, you know maybe last year was a year of excess if I can say that in huge divergences and when I say divergence so you mentioned about Nifty giving uh, you know 18-20% the mid cap index was about 44-45% the small cap index was almost 50% you know when you spoke about characteristic changes in PSU specifically but if I look at the you know from market cap standpoint do you believe there's been a change in characteristics in terms of improving metrics because we have seen large amount of liquidity especially domestic flow into smaller mids yeah, and I reminisce and I just go back to 2017 when I saw a similar trend really building up. Do you think this this divergence is uh, sustainable uh, and probably can play out in 2024 or do you think that you will see again a, a, a rebalancing happening here? Uh, let me answer it in uh, various points. Number one, nothing in market remains in one direction only for any particular category, for any particular name uh, on a forever basis. Mm, if the uh, 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 tree, trees grow and they keep growing, they should touch the sky. But uh, that doesn't happen. And therefore, we in our mental models assume whatever is happening right now will continue to keep happening and more and forever but that is not the way world behaves and that's certainly not the way markets behave therefore any trend which may be more prominent right now uh, is not as important in judging what will happen tomorrow because it is a very very inferior correlation of what is the dominant trend today and what will be dominant trend tomorrow? Uh, historically, time after time, markets have shown that. And therefore, there is no reason to doubt that. Mm, uh, second, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> there is nothing magical about large cap and mid cap and a small cap as a source of the return generation. In other words, there is nothing unique about small cap that in a particular period, small caps have to produce more returns or less returns. Or there is nothing unique about large cap or mid cap per se that in a certain period, they either structurally have to produce more return or less return. That may be observed practical reality in a market at a point of time, which may prevail for some length of time. But there is no rationality or logic that something is a trend has to keep happening. Third, there is a logical fallacy. Ultimately, market cap is an outcome of the causal factors. It is itself not a causal factor. In other words, market cap itself cannot be cause of further market returns, you know, or investment returns. Market cap itself is an outcome of what will make market cap to go up or go down, which is basically character of management, character of the business, size of opportunity, rate of growth, quality of growth, and uh, valuation at which you are participating. These factors decide 
whether <coughs> the uh, other than the valuation argument, all other factors really decide the market cap. <coughs> Evaluation gap or otherwise can be extra source of return or surrender uh, from an investor's uh, perspective. But ultimately, it is these qualities which result in market cap being small or mid or large. In itself, market cap cannot be a cause for a further return generation. And that because it is small cap, it will do well. Or because it is large cap, it will not do well. Or because it is mid-cap, it will do uh, less or more. Uh, there is no logic in that. Totally over long periods of time, if you take a running decade cycle, say to the say year 1 to 10, then year uh, 2 to 11, year 3 to uh, 12, if you take uh, decadal <clears throat> long-term cycles, there is no clear trend that whether mid cap do well or large caps do well or small caps do well. It keeps changing all the time. In a particular decade, uh, one name may, one category may prevail. In the very next second uh, cycle, say year 1 to 10, one cycle may happen, but 2 to 11 cycle may look very different. And 3 to uh, 12, the cycle results may be very different. And... <coughs> This keeps happening again and again. There is no clear trend that a particular category does well or otherwise. Also, there is, even within decadal cycles, there is no major difference in the outcome for a one category vis-a-vis -vis the other ones. Therefore, differences are more pronounced at a point of time, but these differences don't persist. And these differences over different cycle times automatically normalize and uh, there is no clear, logical, predictable pattern. Finally, I would say empirically observed behavior is that uh, small caps and mid caps tend to go up fast, tend to uh, get driven up in a bit of, with a greater frenzy. And they give it away and give it up also with an equal frenzy many a times. This is an observed empirical behavior of the market. But again, that doesn't have to be necessarily the case going forward. In other words, the popular belief is that mid caps and small caps have become too much, too fast, too expensive. And therefore, uh, given the past behavior, they will end up in tears and in a very big problem. And not that in our portfolios, we have too much of a small cap, really. We have, in fact, very little of it. And we do have meaningful mid cap, but not overbearing large number of mid cap. And yet I am saying that it is there is nothing automatic about when I look at mid cap and small cap valuation, that they have to just surrender and they have to fizzle out and they have to tear away. The past cycles, in many cases, there were qualitative challenges, uh, underlying businesses, uh, their fundamental strength, uh, level of market bidding them up in terms of valuation. Also, there were different aberrations. And markets in general were more shallow. Today, markets have become deeper. Uh, underlying behavior has been more mature. And I, while there are valuation differences in favor of uh, smaller cap and mid cap compared to larger cap. But I don't find something outrageous or unreasonable, which is so gross that um, tomorrow uh, suddenly mid cap will collapse and die and small cap may go out of the window completely. And mind you, I'm saying this despite the fact that our portfolios have not too much of uh, really mid cap and uh, very limited amount of small cap in our uh, portfolios. Uh, so I I don't find that there is any reason to believe that these businesses just have to go out of the window. But that said, large cap businesses are also very sound and solid and doing very well. They also have raised the game. And even on a large base, many of the large caps will produce growth rate, which is meaningfully superior. And therefore, that also should not be lost sight of. And some of them valuation-wise also 
probably is uh, uh, represents some little bit more degree of uh, value on the table. One last point I'll make is entrepreneurial spirit and capability of the country is awakened. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks to the way ease of the business, governance practices, government has introduced many reforms and government has created level playing field with the uh, entrepreneurial businesses. Uh, and that entrepreneurial spirit is really on a high. And, uh, you know, some of the smaller businesses, some of the mid-sized businesses, one of the important uh, favorable factor backing them is entrepreneurial capability. That uh, is an element is on a abundance in this country and that it has been ignited and favorably lit up is in the favor of some of these businesses. Uh, India is entrepreneurial in character. Entrepreneurs as a category have created highest value in any country, in any geography, in any market over a period of time compared to any other category. And therefore, entrepreneurial India, where hunger is awakened, even when businesses are small and mid-sized, today they have a far better level playing field. They get access to energy cost at a low, at a similar low level. They get uh, outstanding infrastructure uh, and with a similar uh, advantage that others may get. They get access to capital at favorable terms, which earlier either capital was denied or cost was prohibitive uh, compared to the larger ones. So many of the smaller and large mid-sized businesses today have a greater reason to prosper and thrive compared to past. And therefore, our mechanical forecast based on the analysis of the past may not be right. And we should be mindful about making mechanical forecast by extending past into the future. Things change and our minds, our analysis, our thought process has to be dynamic without ego, without any uh, overbearing belief about what we know or what we understand and without uh, and with agility we have to adapt and change where need be and there is no place for ego in investing and therefore i believe uh, uh, many of the mid size and smaller businesses today have a more favorable backdrop and background and firmament available then probably at any time in the history of this country. And that factor we should not miss out while looking at some of these businesses in the future. Much like I talked about PSUs, I think some of these points are equally valid about smaller and mid-sized uh, businesses where uh, something important has changed about the character of these businesses. Uh, one last question for today. You know, you spoke about valuations and maybe just link in that question here. Uh, I can take more if there are more questions. I have time. I don't have a problem, but uh, up to you. Uh, you please decide. So we'll, we'll take one question here and then yeah. probably we'll, we'll, we'll take the rest uh, offline. Uh, the question was more, I mean, you spoke about valuations being more attractive uh, towards our side of businesses. So, you know, just saying that 2022 was a year of underperformance for us, 2023, we've actually seen an uptick. Deplete 2024 onwards, it will be the turnaround period for ASK. Well, it's very tempting and easy for me to say yes, but it will be dishonest and inappropriate to glibly say like that. So I'll refrain from making any glib or easy or convenient answers. Investing is a hard work. It's a forever work. Every day is a challenge. And we are mindful of the challenge. We are mindful of our responsibility. We are mindful of our trusteeship duty towards our investors. And um, uh, the fact that 22 was not so good doesn't dishearten me. The fact that uh, 24 may turn out to be blockbuster for ASK will not make us overbelieve us. Uh, neither a challenge nor a great outcome will uh, make us get carried away in one direction or the other. A challenge, I think, has to be utilized to benefit from it. And therefore, 2022 challenge, uh, we have analyzed to death many aspects. 
to see how we can benefit and how we can improve upon it. If 2024 turns out to be, like you said, will be a uh, uh, tear away good year for us. I hope it is. But uh, even if it is so, uh, I don't think a uh, good lesson to draw from that will be to get uh, complacent or satisfied. Good lesson to draw from that is that uh, behavior of the markets remain cyclical. Through that cycles, <laughs> we have to draw a path which will remain sustainable on a long-term basis and it must produce two meaningful outcomes. On an absolute basis, it must produce satisfying, compounding, long-term, uh, 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 you know, positive returns uh, on an absolute basis without any argument or debate with Mr. Market. And the second factor that we have to attain is that over a period of time, compared, uh, compared to whatever benchmark said, we have to produce some meaningful positive difference in our favor. We remain acutely aware of both of these responsibilities. The first responsibility, investors don't cast upon us, but we take it upon ourselves is the first one, is a major one. In a... Uh, you see, typically investors will cast an expectation of relative better when markets are positive and rising. Investors uh, cast the reverse order when markets are falling and falling apart. Um, they want positive and absolute. We understand that and we respect that. Uh, and we remain mindful of the duty that on a long term, without any argument with Mr. Market, we must have confidence and belief and processes and stock selection and risk management and uh, capability to produce a um, healthy, satisfying, absolute, positive, compounding outcome. And the second thing that we remain equally uh, committed to is to produce a meaningful difference over a comparison point. Therefore, satisfying absolute, superior relative, both remain our watchwords and duty. So, mm, long answer uh, to a short question, whether 2024 will turn out to be breakaway, tearaway, positive one for ASK, like in the past always has been. I hope so. I believe so. We are working very hard towards that. Whether that will happen or not, time will tell. I have no forecast to make. It will be glib and dis dishonest on my part to just say okay, that is how it will be. We have to be we have to be mindful of processes. We have to be mindful of risk control. We have to be mindful of discipline. If we do all of that right and we remain uh, watchful, watchful on stock selection, and we do not get carried away by good times with ego and don't get uh, depressed with the difficult times with getting depressed. Uh, in other words, we remain agile and careful, watchful. Um, we will continue to generate satisfying absolute and uh, uh, superior relative. And uh, that is not merely expectation, it is our duty to do so. And I regard it as a solemn duty to achieve. And not doing that, uh, uh, the entire blame will lie with us. Uh, it will have nothing to do with market, nothing to do with the world, nothing to do with anything else. If we can't over the long term uh, get a satisfying absolute positive and uh, superior relative, uh, the argument has to be with us, nothing else. <clears throat> Very reassuring, Madhubai. Always a pleasure getting your views. Uh, so participants, in case of any more questions, what we can do is you can share with your managers. We will uh, uh, try and get them answered uh, offline uh, within the set timelines. Again, wishing you all a very, very happy new year. And that can do the session for today. Thank you so much. And thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, bye, everybody. Uh, thank you for... Uh, uh, all the questions that you raise and many that may have been raised but not answered. If at any anything which is particularly uh, that you want to get answered and has not been answered, I'll be more than happy to deal with any question. Uh, however tough, however difficult, however pinpointed, uh, straight and square, I'll be happy to answer in person 
or on the call or at any point of time. So, uh, um, wish all of you a great new year. Uh, I certainly believe uh, this country is embark embarking on a path which is unparalleled. And this country finally is slated to achieve its due place under the sun. And it will be a shame if uh, businesses miss out that opportunity. It will be a shame if markets don't reflect that reality. And it will be a shame if investors don't benefit from that. Um, you don't get wealthy by putting money into fixed income. And fixed income going forward will have even lesser thing to reward uh, given the fact that uh, economies uh, manage far more prudently and structurally cost of capital will come down. Therefore, value creation will reside largely either in building businesses yourself or in buying into good businesses through markets. And those are the sources of value creation. So wishing all of you a steady, uh, unwavering, long-term commitment to that phenomenal path of value creation. Honestly, my uh, I salivate at the prospects of what is ahead in next 10, 20, 30 years. I hope I'm, I live long enough to be able to do for 30, 40 years, but time will tell. But those who, those of you who can uh, should do and every uh, part of your money and your wealth uh, must get committed to be optimized. Thank you, brother. Very, very inspiring. Thanks once again. Thank you. Uh, Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. And wish you a great year again. Bye-bye. <laughs>